Welcome to another edition of Anglican Unscripted, episode 652. I'm Kevin Coulson. I'm George Conger. Today's March 16, 2021. All right, welcome to another show of Anglican Unscripted. I'm looking at my mic, it looks a little hot here. I'll turn that down for you guys so you don't get that boom, boom, boom when I talk, or when I do that. You don't want to hear all that, that's that's ridiculous. All right, so great, you're, you're here for a show. We're gonna have a fun time talking about the news before we get too far. Please like this episode, share this episode, comment on this episode, and if you're not subscribed yet, go to our YouTube channel, click the subscribe button and you'll be ready to go because you will know instantly when there's another episode of Anglican Unscripted. So before we get too far, George, how's your week going? Great. We just reopened for church on Sunday, in-person services, and I had 75 people in the service. And so I'm excited. I had 75 people and I'm terrified. I had 75 people. This time of year, well, this time last year, we had about 250 in the audience, in the mm-hmm. congregation. And this is our season, if you will. We get up to 300 for a few weeks in March and April. Uh, but, you know, I, I feel good. It was a good reopening. But I, I just have this sense in my bones that we're going to lose about 20% of people who've gone to other churches, who've stopped going to church, they've lost the habit, or they're just happy to watch at home. We, we are transitioning now. We went from complete shutdown a year ago, and we're now to the point where, certainly here in, here in Florida, people 65 and older have access to the vaccine and have likely been vaccinated. People in my neighborhood here at the Art River Resort, I think everybody except my wife and I have been vaccinated. Um, what are you going to do now? Do you go shopping? Or do you just go to the restaurants that are still protective and still have the plexiglass? Do you go back to church and sit next to everybody in the pew? Or do you still want to wait a little bit? And that's kind of that transition because what if there's another strain, George? That's always the big news. Oh, the European strain's out again. And we, we still live in this very uncertain time. I think having one-third of your congregation show up for a reopening is awesome. But what we see now, at least in, here in America, is in the community churches around this nation, we've lost 20 to 22% of our congregations. Boom, gone. They, they couldn't make it. it. Basically, those who were going to close within the next five years closed in 2020. Yeah, and even though larger church, well, my church would be considered large uh, within the Episcopal Church. Um, where the average Episcopal Church has, uh, I think, 50, 60 people on a Sunday. Mm -hmm. Uh, If they lose 20%, that's 12 people, and they get pushed down to, say, 48 on a Sunday. At that point, you're not financially viable uh, because you don't have the income not to pay a rector or pay a a minister and keep the building uh, in up to to speed. So bigger churches will lose more people and may have bigger swings percentage-wise. But what's the killer is for smaller churches that they just will fall below a critical mass that allows them to go forward as freestanding institutions. So in our diocese, uh, as I look around, I have four neighboring churches in the county. There are five of us in this in this area, uh, in Hooterville and its suburbs. Um, of those five, uh, two are Vic, two are uh, aided parishes. And I think the other two are getting close to becoming aided parishes, where meaning they can't make it on their own anymore. And they need mm-hmm. financial support from the diocese, and the diocese uh, may want to consolidate. Sells, so you know, you've got five buildings in a county, and you can support why two not churches. Sell two? Yeah. Why not sell two? Uh, con- con- you know, consolidate four and allow the one that's doing okay to continue doing okay. Mm-hmm. I mean, there's, a, there's going to come a point when a business decision has to be made because there's no more money to uh, to fund uh, loss uh, financial lo- financial lo- losses. Sure. Well, losses. that's one of the things they had to do in the Northeast uh, pre-COVID uh, three or four years ago. The Roman Catholic churches there started consolidating. We're going to close this church. We're going to keep this one open. 
There are four churches in one diocese in the Roman Catholic Church that now have the hyphenated names of two churches um, because they had to consolidate. They let uh, some deacons go. They let a, a priest or two go, or they went off to retirement. And they said, you know, we don't have enough congregations to fill all our churches. We're going to take three down to one or two down to one, or in some cases, five churches down to one church in order to remain viable in hopes that one day the very hard ground that is the Northeast will, will produce fruit again. And that was pre-COVID. Now that we've had COVID, it's, it, it's so much worse uh, to see what's happening. For our and we have friends in the Church of England, we have viewers from the Church of England, and before COVID there were a good number of clergy who had rural cures where they would, have, they would basically have five or six parishes that they'd have to cover. Uh, and now when we're reading about uh, the Diocese of Chelmsford, for instance, slashing 20% of its uh, uh, frontline clergy positions, that means you're going to go from seven churches to 15 churches in some parts of the country. How do you offer anything but rote sacramental service? You can't really build pastoral relationships when you're covering 15 people in a in a large geographic area. Um, so the uh, some the, the good suburban churches, the nicer urban churches, uh, churches like mine that have uh, created a niche for themselves and we're doing quite well before and I'll do well again. We don't have any problems, but that's not the majority of parishes. The no. majority of parishes uh, live hand to mouth. They don't have great inherited income. They're not like this church in Herefordshire that found that that old painting above the altar was actually a Titian. And now they've got to come up with uh, tens of thousands of dollars of security cameras to uh, protect this multi-million pound painting in their, in their church. Not everybody's got a titian hanging on the wall to defray expenses. No, they don't. Well, and part of the confusion is the mixed message. You know, we have uh, presiding, presiding, <laughs> we have President uh, Biden telling us that maybe if we're lucky and we're really, really good, maybe we can have July 4 celebrations. We have Dr. Fauci saying, you'll probably have to be wearing a mask in public at least till next Christmas. And then we have the CDC issuing guidelines saying if you're vaccinated, you can gather with other vaccinated persons. Well, that, that's three different messages. And that's a confusion. People uh, who are older than 40 just don't want to deal with. I don't know what the truth is. Do I want to take the chance of going to church? So that's the transition okay. we're at. And as we saw in some of the comments on our previous episodes when we talked about COVID, there are a number of people who watch us who are very, very have very strong views on the efficacy of vaccines, sure. and they reject them out of hand. Um, I, I'm not qualified to offer an opinion as to the veracity of these claims, but they're certainly not of one mind in this country on the proper way forward for COVID uh, mm -hmm. care and relief. No, it, I mean, I mentioned that, you know, in this RV community I'm in, everybody here is vaccinated because they want to travel. You know, part of their thing here is to leave in the middle of April. They're snowbirds. They're going to go back to their home states or go back to uh, traveling to the national parks and stuff like that. Jill and I are like that. We want to go travel. And in order to do that, we'll take the, the risk and take the vaccination because it allows us to, in the eyes of the government, have a little yellow card that says I've been vaccinated and to, to, to travel more freely. And there's people who don't travel, who don't leave their house, who don't care. I don't want the vaccine. I'm going to stay home. And there's anecdotal uh, accounts of a whole range of responses to the vaccine. Mm -hmm. My daughter, who is a nurse who has been working with COVID patients, was one of the first people out in California to have the vaccine. No problem. Her arm was sore for about an hour, and that was it. Uh, the mother of our bookkeeper in this parish, uh, her mother is in her 90s in a nursing home in Florida, had the vaccine and she responded by developing Bell's palsy. Wow. Uh, there's some people who've gotten very ill in our congregation, mm -hmm. fevers, aches, and basically had to be hospitalized by the side effects of the vaccine. And there are other people at the same age, the same mix oh, of yeah. uh, pre-existing conditions who were just fine. So I, 
I'm not qualified to offer any scientific appraisal of what's going on, but if you're looking to be scared, you can find anecdotal evidence to scare you. If you're looking to be reassured, you can find anecdotal evidence to reassure you. But if you're looking to the government, as you said, Kevin, you're getting three messages. Four well, you messages, are. Five uh, messages. Here's the messages today. European Union finally says vaccine is worth the risk. This is March, what I'm looking for here, 16th. The vaccine's been out there for three months. They finally say, okay, we think it's worth the risk. Headline on Drudge, people getting vaccine, developing blood clots. I understand why people are scared, and this is that transition. So we'll have to see what happens. Yeah. Well, I got, I've been in touch with my, uh, uh, my, I don't want to say summer parish, but uh, my Caribbean parish, ah, yes. where I go for a month each year. Bonjour. And I couldn't go last year in November yeah. uh, because they closed the borders. Ah. And now I've been told that uh, uh, I can come back. But when I come and get off the airplane, I have to show proof of vaccination if I want to be allowed on the island again. But for the government, not from the church. Sure. Yeah. All right, George, let's hit some church news beyond <laughs> beyond the vaccines out there. Some people will not say they're vaccines. It's fine. D d whatever. Got it. There's no correct terminology I can use in the scientific sphere. So let's talk about the Vatican. The Vatican has issued a statement rejecting blessing same-sex unions. And they put together a document probably over the last couple of years uh, in, in the same way the ACNA did what does the church believe why do we believe it and they went through and talked about sacrament talked about uh canon laws talked about scripture talked about the church itself and said we cannot in any way um bless same-sex unions because nothing in our tradition allows for that because nothing in scripture allows for that because nothing um uh, we don't see any way that God would endorse that type of behavior. And they used the word licit a lot, which was kind of cool. I've, you see illicit all the time? This was licit. So here we, we find it. Uh, oh, well put together. Actually, they, they went even a little further by okay. saying that they can't bless sin. That's correct. So in other words, it wasn't so much an argument from absence, but rather homosexual activity is considered sin and separates you from God and the church cannot bless something that is anti-god correct they did not An go act. a step they didn't go the step further that the ACNA did and say what can we call you you know that it, can we hyphenate uh, uh, and call you gay Roman Catholic or uh, gay Christian? They didn't go that far, but they just said basically, this is you know been the wording since for two thousand years. We're going to keep to it. This is why. And I think it was a fairly laid out document. I kind of enjoyed the ACNA document a little bit more, but this puts them into line with you know good orthodoxy, George. Small O orthodoxy, Small. not uh, yeah. big O Russian <laughs> orthodoxy. Um, this arose formally because of the Rush German and Austrian Catholic bishops conferences have endorsed the uh, concept of blessing same-sex unions. We're not talking marriage now, we're talking about unions. And there are portions of the American Catholic Church, the English Catholic Church, European Catholic Churches, Brazilian Catholic Church, that are quite keen to advance the uh, gay agenda, for want of a better phrase. And so this was formally brought to them. This was not their picking this fight. This fight was brought to them by the Germans and the Austrians. And on this show, we've reported about a diocese, Klagenfurt in Austria, uh, where uh, diocesan staffer, uh, the youth minister, director of the diocese, married a same-sex couple in a Catholic church about that last year when Gavin was a part of our show. Mm -hmm. So there's a significant strand within the European and American Catholic Church that is keen to push this forward. And the Catholic Ch and the Congregation for the Doctrine of Faith, CDF, 
which had been under, I believe, Cardinal Sarah the, from Guinea, a very fiery African prelate, conservative fiery, basically said, Recently no, retired. no, no, yeah, yeah. not going to happen. Now, this may have been his swan song. This may have been his last official act. Then once this uh, is done, he got out of there because, um, because after the CDF does its work, it's sent to the Pope and goes through the various agencies to make sure everybody's on board, and then it's made public. But the uh, response will be what we saw uh, in the, for the ACNA, that we're going to see the a Dear Gay Catholics letter from concerned Roman Catholics in the US and other places, basically tearing apart the Catholic statement. And just as the Dear Gay Anglicans letter, its intention, its stated intention may not have been to take a swipe at the leadership but its uh, impact was to take a smack at the leadership. We're going to see that same thing play out, but much more uh, vigorously in the Catholic world. Well, I think so. I think, you know, I have uh, several Facebook friends who are celibate uh, gay Roman Catholics who said, God, sorry, this boat has sailed. You guys are way too late on this. This should have been something you put out 10 years ago. Um, it's too little, too late. And the interesting thing, you know, I'm part of a lot of Facebook news groups and, you know, uh, local news to Milford or wherever I've lived before, where I, I'm watching them post stories, local impact, a Vatican statement. We ask local clergy <laughs> what they think. And you know, to be fair, you, you're seeing this on, on the West Coast, the, the Western priest does not concur with the, what the Vatican just said. They said, you know, we need to be more open to the sacrament of blessing or being able to bless these individual relationships. And I don't think the whole bandwagon is following the Pope on this. No. Uh, well, some people will say it's not the Pope, it's the CDF. Sure. Uh, but if the Pope That's didn't fair. sign off, it wouldn't have gotten that far. Yeah. But you're absolutely right, Kevin. I, I just can't wait to see what America Magazine, the Jesuit Magazine, uh, will have to say about this. They'll mm -hmm. they'll pick it apart and they'll they'll be Jesuitical and find a way forward that uh, uh, honors the language but not the spirit of the statement. Um, but the uh, I think the funny thing is is uh, we have. Uh, I hear again and again about people leaving the Anglican world and going to the Catholic world because they want to have security of doctrine. They want to have a solid foundation. They just can't take this shifting sands of orthodoxy. Well, friends, that there is no solid rock uh, that's not under assault or attack. The Anglican ship may have been holed first, but the torpedoes in the water aimed at the Catholic uh, Church. There's even a movement in the Orthodox world to change teachings on homosexuality. Absolutely. Uh, yeah. Callisto Ware uh, being the most famous name mm -hmm. who's offered, who's, who's basically offering a liberalizing view on women clergy mm -hmm. and human sexuality. So this is, there's no place you can hide anymore. You can't hide in the Catholic Church and have that old time religion that hasn't changed from the beginning of time. Um, you could fool yourself and you could probably find a traditionalist parish here or there, but the tides are right raising all boats in the religious world. Uh, we just happened to be swamped. The first, we were sw one of the first to be swamped. We were swamped. And, you know, you, you can look back at many different reasons. You know, there there is no common doctrine. Well, I got the prayer book. No, it wasn't good enough. There's no magisterium. Well, that, we didn't want one. Yours is bad. <laughs> and so, you know, there, there's lots of reasons Anglicanism or the Anglican communion is, as a whole uh, has been hit by so many torpedoes. So, as you say, let's move on to some other news. Justin Welby, Archbishop Canterbury, lives in Britain, in case you didn't know this, uh, has condemned the sin of male violence. M-A-L-E, not M-A-I-L. In response... You mean not postman going crazy just, with... Uh, listen, we've had it here in not America. Not going postal. Not going postal. Uh, in response to the Saren Everend... Everend uh, how do you pronounce the last name? 
Ever Everend. Everend. Murder. Um, George, tell us about Sarah, and then we can talk about the story. Sarah was a 33-year-old girl, college graduate, well-educated, had a good job in a marketing firm, who was walking across Clapham Common, which is one of the larger, we'd call them parks in the United sure. States, city parks in a nicer section of London, and she disappeared. Uh, she had been talking on the phone with her boyfriend, security cameras along the way saw her, then she disappeared. And her body was found uh, in the woods somewhere. An arrest has been made, and it was a 48-year-old London policeman who uh, has been charged with kidnapping and murder. And it was a sex crime. He was, if, if, the, if the accusations are proven true, this is a psychopath, this is a, a nut job. Mm -hmm terrible thing but sex crimes are going to happen so long as they're twisted and depraved people in this world it, now in any other time 20 years ago a generation ago 100 years ago this is another story in the paper it's a horrible tragedy you pray for the family you say, why does this happen you incarcerate the individual hold them to the full accountability of the law but now in the age of social media, in the age of wokeness, in the age of uh, online, this story has taken a completely different tone. And it's now about male violence. It's now about yeah. guilty by association. Because you're a male, you are just like this police officer who raped this individual, according well, to Justin Wolby. The... Uh the story developed and it went from being a, a tragedy of a lovely girl with a promising bright future murdered by a nut job into a political issue of the meat of the, the resurrection of the Me Too movement in England. Mm -hmm. uh, of and you had just some silly statements. You had uh, a politician, baroness, somebody or other, saying that there should be a 6 p.m. curfew for men. I think she might have been joking. But, she was joking, kids, but, but still. But, the, but then there was a big uh, rally on uh, uh, at, a, at a park in London, and that was... Uh, the, the, the police said you can't do it because of the COVID laws and well the people did it anyway and it got out of hand and the police had to break it up and of course the police are filmed uh wrestling to the ground some of the more obnoxious angry women protesters and then you get the response by liberal politicians oh police violence we have to have a full investigation male police and violence male so, police you, violence yes and the female police commissioner uh cressida dick uh that's her name i'm not making a joke uh said uh oh i'm not resigning i was just we were just doing our duty and then justin welby without fail the man just has a tin he has either the worst staff advising him and writing these things or the man is a is a pr cretin uh let me just read what justin welby writes uh, he released a statement on Facebook and it says testimony after testimony from women over the recent days have shown us something we have known and ignored far too long. The profound impact of the sin of male violence, intimidation, harassment, sexism and abuse carried out against these women. It is these sins and the culture that perpetuates and condones them that need our urgent repentance, our fervent prayer and our resolute action as men. Now, I think the best repost to Justin Welby was by a college classmate of the dead woman, a friend, a contemporary, who said in an interview in the Daily Mail, I didn't go to the protest march. My friend's terrible, shameful, tragic death has been hijacked by the women activists and the woke crowd, the Me Too crowd, into an assault against all men, rather than against the one man who committed this crime. Hmm. Um, Justin Welby's sin of violence, uh, of male violence. I, I just don't know how to respond to somebody as inane and asinine. Yeah. 
<laughs> if this it, is, it, th is there no such thing as original sin? There's only original male sin. Was not Are the we first sin committed by a woman? Are we no, keeping no. women in Perda? I mean, <laughs> Just, come on, Justin. Uh, let's not. Let's get off the woke bandwagon and actually uh, stand for Christ and the gospel. Uh, or, or are, you name names. More? If you're going to do this, let's name names. Governor Cuomo has 30 women, former staffers, uh, accusing him of sexual harassment. Uh, unwanted touching, unwanted kissing, unwanted, unwanted, unwanted. But because he is of a liberal bent, he's allowed to go free. Biden, the president of the United States of America, was accused by a former staffer of sexual, uh, it was date rape, I, but I don't know what you call it back in the 70s when it occurred. Um, she told everybody at the time she was completely ignored because a liberal person of the right persuasion is allowed to conduct themselves in that way without being challenged. It's and his, Me Too is over, and yet Justin Welby is in the middle of Me Too. And he is a hypocrite. Justin Welby has refused to meet with the victims of Jonathan Fletcher and John Smythe. He's, and he is tied into this circle. He knew about this abuse, uh, especially especially the Smythe abuse. Um, he made public statements that he would meet and offer with these guys. He never did. And let's just, let me reread. It is these sins of male violence and the culture that perpetuates and condones them that need our urgent repentance, our fervent prayer, and a resolute action is met. It is the culture that perpetuates. It. it is that evangelical old boy network that, that Justin Welby is part and parcel of, who refuse to name names and call out per, uh, predators, but allows uh, the, the guilty go well, scot-free and ignores the victims. I, I am not, when my criticisms of Justin Welby are not saying he's wrong to condemn violence and cultures of uh, oppression and and cultures of harassment but he should be consistent and condemn all oppression all violence and rather than condemn uh the shameful act of a of, against a wonder uh, against an innocent girl he should be a repenting and speaking about the things of which he has taken part failure to act on sexual abuse within the church of england by clergy and church leaders and if you falsely accuse somebody, it's okay to say you're sorry. I'm thinking of a certain bishop who was falsely accused. Um, yeah. The lumber sliver verse, This was it was written for this. Justin Welby. Okay, uh, let's move on to some other news. Bishop Herzog, Diocese of Albany, has resigned from the Episcopal Church's House of Bishops effective after Easter. Um, he was the bishop before Bishop Love in Albany, and as we know that uh, Bishop Love has resigned as well, we know that a lot of people in the diocese, a lot of clergy, are moving on to uh, uh, relationships with the ACNA uh, through Julian Dobbs and others. Things do not look good at all for Albany right now, and this, to me, this is the tipping point where um, there's no way to really recover, even if they get a good bishop, um, the people who've left and the damage that's been done by uh, certain decisions in the House of Bishops and General Convention in the last 10 years, George. Well, I don't think we see eye to eye completely on this point. Mm -hmm. um, I think Albany can recover and can flourish, uh, but when people walk away at this stage, they only harm an institution. In my time in the Episcopal Church, I have seen good dioceses flip because people have left prematurely. Colorado being Colorado, example. perfect example. They went to Colorado. Uh, you know when at you know when the first uh, uh, parishes left uh, and, and joined what became AMIA. AMIA um, it basically tipped the political balance and so that you could usher in a liberal bishop and the liberal bishop uh, be, when conservatives just started peeling away the conservative center 
collapsed. And we saw that again and again and again of people, well, it's, it's my view, the point that you need to stay in fight and stay with and protect your people. Um, and what we're seeing here in Albany is Dan Herzog has already left once for the Catholic Church. He came back. He's leaving again. Don't know where he's going. Don't know what he's doing. But I think it's a mistake to do this when they're in an interregnum where Bishop Love is retired. But Bishop Love is still in the Episcopal Church. He's not left the Episcopal Church. He's just retired from the ministry. Under duress, but he's still. <laughs> and we don't know where he'll eventually wind up. No. And there have been reports that some clergy in the diocese, we don't know how many, are thinking about joining uh, Julian Dobbs's diocese. Again, you have a small nucleus of unpleasant people in the Diocese of Albany who made life hell for Bishop Love. And when the people who sort of say, I'm picking up my marbles and going home, they leave the, they leave the playing field to those people. So Albany could you know, conceivably, uh, you need to stand together when you're under attack. You don't need, uh, you know, peeling off to take care of your own interests may be the good short-term solution for you personally, but what does it do for the people that you're called to serve? It, it's an interesting dichotomy because it's a minority uh, opposing the bishop by reporting to the majority leadership of the Episcopal Church coming down then again on the bishop. They brought Bishop Love up on charges. Does Bishop Love stay and fight? Some bishops st stood and fought. Some said, this is ridiculous, there's got to be a better way forward. Uh, and, and they made those choices. Um, I I had wished that Albany had been that, that stalwart bond diocese that, that stood there and stayed the test of time the Episcopal Church, but I think at some point people are are sick and tired of the politics and they just want to grow their churches. You're able to do that in a safe diocese uh, here in Central Florida. There are a lot of uh, places where you can't have a vibrant church because you have a bad bishop. Now I agree there's lots of different types of bishops and there's good bishops who do a bad job and there's bad bishops who do a good job. Um, it's one of the strangest things uh, to see in church leadership. And as such, um, what do you do in this type of situation? Of course, we would want um, people like Bishop Herzog to make his own decisions, but uh, this is going to be a hard day for Albany in the future. Well, Albany can recover, it can flourish, it can prosper. Now, Albany is one of the most economically depressed parts of the country. Absolutely. It's unfortunately in New York, has one of the highest tax rates. Mm -hmm. the weather's not, weather's nice about three months of the year. Uh, but the industrial base has been yes. declining for 40, 50 years and they've got to reinvent themselves. And they eventually will. But the my hope for Albany is that the excitement and the power and the joy of knowledge and love and fellowship of Jesus Christ is brought back in into it the day-to-day -day work that uh, I'm not saying that the the leaders aren't doing that now but I'm just saying I pray that the spirit lift that place up it's had such a beating over the years uh, unnecessary beating but it can be a light to Christ um, a light to people for Jesus Christ mm -hmm. and I just pray that they stick together long enough to find a find a future where they can flourish who they are and not just be a pale imitation of the Diocese of Central New York or the Diocese of Vermont on either side of them. Indeed. All right, let's move on to our final story. Um, John Pokinghorn has uh, passed. He was a dynamic person who certainly brought science, theology, religion, and Christianity into a bound of understanding. And uh, I thought we could talk a little bit about him. Uh, you know the story more than I do. I, as a Christian, love Christianity because science supports it and, when thought clearly, acknowledges it. John thought the same. So, George, science and religion, and its supporter, John. 
John Polkinghorne. Uh, I, uh, I'll do a little, what are my rabbit trails? Okay. John Polkinghorne was the Reverend Canon Sir Doctor Professor. And there are clergy, I know, who would use every single one of those titles in their name. Sure. He was knighted by the Queen. He was a canon of cathedral. He was a PA, he earned a PhD in physics. He had earned DD degrees. Um, he was John Polkinghorne was an English uh, mathematical physicist. He was educated at Cambridge, and in and he went back uh, to Cambridge in '58 after teaching in the U.S. And by 1979, he was professor of mathematical physics. This is. Uh, uh, a very probably the most prestigious uh, professorship in that field, mm -hmm. certainly in the UK. Yeah. And in 1979, he shocked everybody. He was 45 years of age, a little over 45, and he resigned as a professorship and went to seminary to become a parish priest. And he jokingly said that mathematicians do all their best work by the time they're 45. But Polkinghorne had always <laughs> Polkinghorne had always been a Christian, but yeah. he felt the call to parish ministry, and he returned to the parish ministry. But he was eventually called back to Cambridge and became the president of a college, and a fellow at uh, uh, Trinity Hall and president of Queen's College. Mm -hmm. But Polkinghorne, his uh, skill was to basically explain to the person in the pew, to people like me, who are not scientists, who didn't do that well in physics, in calculus, in college and high school, that there is no contradiction between science and God as revealed in Jesus Christ. And Polkinghorne, uh, he, had the, he had the concept of meta-questions, that there are a number of questions that science cannot answer using the scientific method. And that we need to think about, if you will, where God is in all of this. And he wasn't one of these gods in the gaps. In other words, we can explain this, then we can't explain that, therefore that must be God, but eventually we'll explain that and God disappears. Rather, God is behind everything in all of this. Mm -hmm. And it is through his divine will that these things all work themselves out. And this is one of the great mathematical physicists of the 20th, 21st century, uh, bringing together the compatibility of science, the scientific method, and full faith in Jesus Christ. So Polkinghorne was one of these people who, to fellow scientists, he would say, you know, go wherever your studies lead you, and don't be fearful that believing in Jesus Christ is somehow contradicted by what you'll discern. And he's able to talk to people like me who are, who are saying, you know, science is no threat to your faith in Jesus Christ. Or, right. you're, or and, there's and, no threat to science from, Jesus, from believing in Jesus Christ. And that was John's strength, lay speak. Being able to communicate with the unscienced <laughs> <laughs> in his world, everybody else, uh, you know, about, you know, religion and science together. That, you know, the scientific method uh, of study, hypothesis testing, um, does not take away anything in faith, religion, um, because it, 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 it's backed and it's found and provable in science. There's people who prove it and don't like the results and will continue to study and study and study. But there's so many things that science itself doesn't have the ability to answer. Creation, uh, their Big Bang, uh, and, and I can think of at least a dozen other ones, that you don't need to worry about the stuff they can't answer because in Christ is many other answers. In fact, it is the uh, answer. Polkinghorne was... Uh was said to have a generous orthodoxy. Uh, what does that mean, a generous orthodoxy? Does that mean whatever floats your boat, man, that's okay? No. But rather, uh, Polkinghorne, in any ways, uh, exemplified the best of the Anglican method. And the Anglican method is agreeing that we may not necessarily agree on some of the minutiae, but we agree on the essentials, that Jesus Christ is Lord. 
so that Polkinghorn uh, could work with people across the denominational spectrums. He could work with Catholics. He could work with ev you know evangelicals in a common faith in God and not get hung up. Now, some people will say, but these little things are essential, and if you don't believe in penal substitutionary atonement or the uh, or the uh, Virgin, the minutia. or the or the assumption of Mary, <laughs> you're not a real Christian. Therefore, the argument stops. Okay, Buckingham uh, with okay. I, I've been one of these. Yeah, he was a, yeah great. I've been given the signal that the uh, person I share an office with has to to make a conference call. So I'm going to put a link to uh, some poking horn, horn I can't say his name, it's so late, uh, uh, stuff in the show notes. Uh, George, we need to break here. This has been a wonderful episode. I'm Kevin Coulson. Uh, I'm so depressed because I was going to do Indian corruption, but since it's not today, it's just, I, I'm George Conger, and you've been watching episode 652 of Anglican Unscripted. Hello.